The NATO military alliance held its 2020 summit in Madrid, bringing together Western leaders to push for a new Cold War on both Russia and China. But there were a few Spanish lawmakers who rebelled against this NATO summit, who criticized the U.S.-led military alliance. And in this video here, I have some video clips from an incredible speech that was given by a leftist Spanish lawmaker named Gerardo Pizarrejo. And in this speech that he gave on the floor of the parliament, he condemned the NATO military alliance for pushing for more war instead of peace, for enriching the military industrial complex and U.S. weapons corporations like Lockheed Martin, while his people suffer from an inflation crisis and an energy crisis. He said that NATO does not exist to push for peace. Instead, he said that NATO is organizing this summit in Madrid to serve U.S. geopolitical interests and to push for a new Cold War on China. And he called for a new security model for Europe that is truly autonomous and independent from the United States. And he wanted a security model that, is, that pushes for peace and respect for the global South citing left-wing leaders in Latin America. This was an incredible, powerful speech, and it shows that there are some leftist politicians inside Europe who are pushing against NATO and U.S. imperialism and the constant war drive to enrich the military-industrial complex. At the end of this video, I have translated the full speech that the Spanish lawmaker gave, but here I'm going to show a few clips of his speech, and then I'm going to provide analysis to, to understand the political context of this NATO summit and his speech. So without further ado, these are some clips from the leftist Spanish lawmaker Gerardo Pizarrejo. Es evidente que Europa necesita un nuevo modelo de seguridad. Pero si algo hemos aprendido de todo eso, tenemos que tener claras dos cosas al menos. La primera, que ese modelo de seguridad tiene que ser un modelo autónomo, un modelo europeo, no un modelo subordinado a Estados Unidos, que la cumbre de la OTAN no se ha organizado para fortalecer la causa de la paz. Esta cumbre se ha organizado básicamente para reforzar las prioridades geoestratégicas de los Estados Unidos, que no son Ucrania, que no son Europa, sino que son sobre todo debilitar a China. Por eso, señorías, Mr. Marshall no ha venido a esta cumbre con un pacto de inversiones sociales y verdes bajo el brazo. No ha venido con un, con un Green Deal, New Deal bajo el brazo. Ha venido a vendernos caro su gas de esquisto contaminante, sus granos transgénicos y sobre todo las armas de Lockheed Martin y de su industria bélica. Y han venido a decirnos que más que parar la guerra lo que hay que hacer es alimentarla. Sumarnos al ardor belicista que vienen a exhibir hoy aquí en medio de una grave emergencia social y energética sería un acto propio de pirómanos. Supondría dedicar millones de euros a enriquecer el negocio armamentístico cuando ni la inflación ni el desempleo se van a resolver sembrando Europa con más ojivas nucleares o con más buques de guerra. Hay un nuevo orden multilateral que está emergiendo, que es irreversible y que ningún imperio, ni viejo ni nuevo, va a poder detener. So those were some of the clips highlighting this very powerful speech that was given on the floor of Spain's parliament during the NATO summit. I wrote an article about this over at multipolarista.com. It's titled Spanish lawmaker NATO subordinates Europe to U.S., pushes war on China, and riches weapons companies. And you can see a photo here of the Madrid summit held by NATO from June 29th to June 30th. And then on the right, you can see this Spanish lawmaker named Gerardo Pizarrejo, who spoke on the floor of the parliament. I'm going to summarize some of the main points in his speech and provide context. And at the end of this video, I'll have the full speech with English language translation. So. Uh, Pizarrejo is a member of a leftist party in Catalonia, which is called Barcelona en Comú, which means Barcelona in common in Catalan, the language of Catalonia. And Gerardo Pizarrejo Prados is actually Spanish Argentine. He was born in Argentina and he was raised in Spain and is a politician in, from the leftist party that Barcelona en Comú, which is affiliated with P Podemos. Podemos is a socialist party in Spain nationally, and one of its affiliates in Catalonia is this party of Gerardo Pizarrejo. And in his speech, he, he noted that, that the summit, quote, was not organized to strengthen the cause of peace. Rather, the summit, quote, was organized basically to reinforce the geostrategic priorities of the United States, above all to weaken China. 
la cumbre de la OTAN no se ha organizado para fortalecer la causa de la paz, esta cumbre se ha organizado básicamente para reforzar las prioridades geoestratégicas de los Estados Unidos, que no son Ucrania, que no son Europa, sino que son sobre todo debilitar a China. Now this is important because it's a European politician acknowledging the fact that NATO is not about European security. NATO is about reinforcing the geostrategic interests of the United States. That is, the U.S. is the leader of NATO and it subordinates Europe. And he says that it's evident that Europe needs a new model of security, but that model has to be autonomous, a European model, not a model subordinated to the United States. It's evident that Europe needs a new model of security. Pero si algo hemos aprendido de todo eso, tenemos que tener claras dos cosas al menos. La primera, que ese modelo de seguridad tiene que ser un modelo autónomo, un modelo europeo, no un modelo subordinado a Estados Unidos. So once again here we see that he's acknowledging that NATO is about subordinating Europe to the United States and that Europe does need a security model that is independent and autonomous from the United States. And we see this in this language he used, very powerful language. When Joe Biden, the U.S. president, arrived to Spain, Pizarro noted that the Spanish president, Pedro Sanchez, and the Spanish king, Felipe VI, because Spain is still a monarchy, even though they talk about democracy and all this, it's still a monarchy, constitutional monarchy. And when Joe Biden arrived in Spain at the airport, when he, when he got out of the U.S. presidential plane, he was met by the Spanish president, Sanchez, and King, and Pizarrejos, the Spanish lawmaker, said that basically the Spanish leaders were kowtowing, bowing down to the real leader, imperial leader, the U.S. president. And he said that they were, quote, surrendering ourselves in vassalage to NATO. Porque lo que América Latina espera de nosotros no es como propuso Felipe VI después de recibir a Biden a pie de avión que les invitemos a rendir vasallaje a la OTAN. So he's saying that the U.S. uses NATO to turn Europe into its vassals and this kind of neo-feudal relationship subordinating Europe as serfs, as vassals to the U.S. colonial overlord, the U.S. Uh, you know, master, the feudal lord of the serfs in Europe. And he also gave a, a very, um, he made a very tongue-in-cheek comments here condemning the U.S. He's saying that when the U.S. came to Spain for the NATO summit, it wasn't to provide resources for social programs and environmental policies. No, it was to, quote, sell us at a high price. It's polluting shale gas. It's GMO grains. And above all, the weapons of Lockheed Martin and its war industry. Por eso, señorías, Mr. Marshall no ha venido a esta cumbre con un pack de inversiones sociales y verdes bajo el brazo. No ha venido con un, con un Green Deal, New Deal bajo el brazo. Ha venido a vendernos caro su gas de esquito contaminante, sus granos transgénicos y sobre todo las armas de Lockheed Martin y de su industria bélica. Y han venido a decirnos que más que parar la guerra, lo que hay que hacer es alimentarla. So, very powerful comment there. He's saying that the U.S. is trying to sell at a high price polluting energy like shale gas instead of the cheap energy coming from Russia. He's saying that the U.S. is bringing its, its GMO grains from Monsanto and other big ag corporations and the weapons of the military industrial complex and corporations like Lockheed Martin. So those are the industries that the U.S. pioneers in. Fossil fuels, big ag, and the, and the military industrial complex. Now, another interesting note about the comments that he made here in this speech in the Spanish parliament. At one point in this tongue-in-cheek comment, he referred to the United States not as Uncle Sam, which would be Tío Sam in Spanish, but rather, rather he referred to the U.S. military, uh, the U.S. government rather, as Mr. Marshall. And this is a reference to a famous movie in Spain, a Spanish movie that is called Bienvenido, Mr. Marshall, which means welcome, Mr. Marshall, which is a movie, it's a satirical uh, you know, metaphorical movie about a U.S. diplomat who comes to Spain named Mr. Marshall. And of course, it's called Mr. Marshall because of the Marshall Plan. And the joke of the movie is that this town in Spain is patiently waiting for the U.S. diplomat to arrive. They have all these preparations and everything, and they're really excited. And then when 
the U.S. diplomat in his car arrives, he just quickly drives through the city, the, t the town, and ignores everyone and leaves immediately. And it's basically a metaphor for the kind of neo-colonial policies that the U.S. carried out in Europe after World War II, basically subordinating Europe to the United States. And that scene today with, you know, European lawmaker, European governments basically cannot have an independent foreign policy. They cannot take actions independent of the United States. It's this kind of neo-colonial relationship. So that's why in his speech, he's calling for an autonomous policy that makes Europe truly independent and not always completely just ob obediently obeying the orders that Washington tells it, Washington gives to Europe. But anyway, here, let me continue going back to look at other parts of his speech. Now, I mentioned also earlier that uh, Gerardo Pizarrejo, this leftist Spanish politician, is part of the socialist political party Barcelona en Comú, and he's a member of the Congress of Deputies. Spain has a bicameral parliament, and the lower chamber is the Congress of Deputies. Um, it also has a Senate, which is the upper chamber. And Gerardo Pizarrejo Prados is the first secretary of the Congress of Deputies. He's also a member of the Foreign Affairs Committee. So he, he's a, a relatively important member of the Congress. And he gave this speech on the floor of the parliament on June 29th, which was the day of the Madrid summit, which was held on the 29th and the 30th. And he also called for a new paradigm of, quote, peace and, quote, respectful relations with the global south. So he's calling for going against the colonial history of Spain and having respectful relations with the global south. He cited left-wing leaders in Latin America, like Lula da Silva, the former president of Brazil, and also Andres Manuel López Obrador, the president of Mexico. And he acknowledged that the unipolar order of the U.S. empire is in decline, and th there is a multipolar world that is emerging. These are the comments he said, quote, there is a new multilateral world order that is emerging, which is irreversible, and which no empire, neither old or new, is going to be able to stop. No permitan, señorías de la derecha, que las soflamas neocoloniales de los marqueses de Vargallosa estropeen esta oportunidad. Porque si eso ocurre, les puedo asegurar que África y América se rebelarán. Hay un nuevo orden multilateral que está emergiendo, que es irreversible y que ningún imperio, ni viejo ni nuevo, va a poder detener. So, condemning U.S. imperialism and the unipolar order, calling for a multipolar order, respecting the global south. And then he added that the main threat to European security is not refugees, it's not people fleeing from the global south and in this in these comments he was acknowledging specifically that this june there was a massacre of dozens of african refugees and migrants in melilla which is a spanish colonial enclave city in northern africa in, in morocco and there were hundreds of asylum seekers from sub-saharan africa who were trying to cross into this Spanish colonial enclave, which is called Melilla. And what happened is that the Spanish security uh, services, they, in, an, in a joint operation carried out by the Moroccan security services, violently cracked down on these African refugees and immigrants. And dozens were killed and hundreds were wounded. It was a brutally violent massacre of African asylum seekers carried out by Moroccan security services backed by the Spanish security services. And he's acknowledging that here by saying the threat to European security is not refugees. Rather, quote, the principal security threat are the imperial disputes for energy resources. So there he's acknowledging these, these imperialist wars raged by, waged by the United States and NATO. And he's saying that the other main threat to European security is the concentration of wealth the inequality that creates and the immigrations, the, the migrations. So he's acknowledging that this massive inequality is what creates this massive concentration of wealth of the rich creates inequalities. And those inequalities also drive migrations of these refugees and immigrants. Nosotros, por ejemplo, hubiéramos querido hospedar una cumbre 
en la que se recuerde que la principal amenaza para la seguridad no son los refugiados ucranianos o los refugiados sirios o los africanos, que la principal amenaza para la seguridad son las disputas imperiales por recursos energéticos, la concentración de la riqueza, las desigualdades que provocan las migraciones. Now, in this speech, the Spanish lawmaker Pizarrello, he also denounced the demand by the U.S. and NATO that European governments boost military spending to 2% of GDP. And he noted that this would involve, quote, dedicating millions of euros to enriching the weapons trade when neither inflation nor unemployment is going to be resolved by filling Europe with more nuclear warheads or more warships. So once again, spending millions of dollars, billions of euros on the military industrial complex is not going to help fight inflation and unemployment at a time when there is a massive economic crisis around the world. Supondría dedicar millones de euros a enriquecer el negocio armamentístico cuando ni la inflación ni el desempleo se van a resolver sembrando Europa con más ojivas nucleares o con más buques de guerra. He pointed out that the combined military spending of France, Germany, Italy, and Spain is already four times greater than Russia's military spending. So why does NATO need to spend more and more money on the military when it's already significantly larger than Russia's? And of course, U.S. military spending is 10 times larger than Russia's military spending. Hubiéramos querido una cumbre en la que se explicara que aumentar el gasto militar cuando hay necesidades acuciantes y cuando solo Francia, Alemania, Italia y España cuadriplican el gasto militar de Rusia es un sinsentido absoluto. And he said uh, very well, he said that increasing the military budget, quote, in the middle of a dire social and energy emergency would truly be the act of a pyromaniac. So once again, Quite powerful comments here. Sumarnos al ardor belicista que vienen a exhibir hoy aquí en medio de una grave emergencia social y energética sería un acto propio de pirómanos. Now, before I go to the full speech of the Spanish lawmaker, I want to provide context for the economic crisis in Spain in particular, because since the 2008 financial crash that hit the entire world, the south of Europe, especially Spain, has been suffering from economic problems, high rates of unemployment and poverty and austerity measures that were imposed on Spain by the unelected bureaucrats in Brussels from the European Union. And Spain has had a series of neoliberal governments that have completely failed to break with the neoliberal policies and austerity policies that have been imposed since 2008. So I noted that the U.S., which controls NATO, has been pressuring all member states to devote 2% of their GDP to military spending. Although in a country like Spain, that is very difficult considering the economic difficulties it's going through. So Spain announced during the Madrid summit that it's going to increase military spending to 2% of GDP by 2030. Spain already, for context, spends 1.03% of its GDP on military expenditure, and that amounts to 12.21 billion euros, which is about, uh, you know, it's nearly 13 billion US dollars. So that means that in the next seven years, by 2030 at the latest, Madrid is pledging to double its military spending to roughly 24 billion euros, around 25 billion US dollars. And for context, even before Russia initiated this military operation in Ukraine and invaded this February, although the war in Ukraine had gone on since 2014, since the US backed coup, in the past seven years, again, before Russia sent its troops into Ukraine, Spain was already increasing its military spending in the past seven years, it increased it by more than $2 billion from 0.93% of GDP to 1.03% of GDP. Now, I note that Spain's current government is a kind of liberal centrist government, which is led by the hilariously, ironically named PSOE party, PSOE, which technically means the Spanish Socialist Workers Party, although many people point out it's neither socialist 
nor a workers' party. It's completely neoliberal. It is a centrist party that really, in, in governing, has been kind of indistinguishable from the main right-wing party, the Partido Popular, the, the People's Party. They're both completely neoliberal parties. They represent the neoliberal status quo. So PSOE is not a socialist party. It is not a workers' party. It is a neoliberal party. And it's proposing to boost military expenditure in alliance with U.S. imperialism and the NATO military cartel. Now, Spain's left-wing party, the real left-wing party, which is called Podemos, they are opposing military this military increase. They're saying that this money should be spent on social programs to help people. Although Spain's left-wing party, Podemos, is technically part of the coalition government, it is a really a minor force in the coalition government. It has very little influence. And a lot of people on the Spanish left have criticized Podemos. They think this is a major mistake because they've been unable to oppose the austerity measures and the neoliberal policies of the PSOE uh, forces that dominate the government. And the party, uh, the, the president of Spain, Pedro Sanchez, who, who's from PSOE, and he's been imposing neoliberal policies. So that, that's actually hurt Podemos in the elections. It's hurt its image because they say they're a left-wing party, but they're going along with this neoliberal party. Meanwhile, the right, the mainstream right-wing party, the Partido Popular, the, the People's Party, which is not a people's party, it's a total right-wing oligarchic party, they're technically in the opposition of the government, but they support the government's proposed increase of military spending. So, meanwhile, Spain already has tens of billions of dollars worth of debt to in, in foreign weapons contracts to U.S., uh, the U.S. and to other countries in, in terms of buying military equipment. And economic experts have warned, there's a really good article for people who read Spanish in El Diario, uh, a left-leaning Spanish newspaper. And economic experts warn that the country is going to be forced to impose even more austerity and neoliberal policies to pay off this debt that it already has. And I mentioned that since the 2008 crash, there has been a, a large economic crisis in Spain with neoliberal austerity policies imposed on Spain by the bureaucrats in Brussels from the European Union. And I note that after the 2008 crash, unemployment hit more than 20 percent. And as of 2021, officially unemployment is at 13 percent nationally, although the actual figure is probably higher. And in the southern, southern provinces of Spain, you can see in this graph here, in the southern provinces, there are parts of Spain that reach 22 and 21 percent unemployment. So unemployment is a major problem. For people under 25, around one third of people under 25 can't find a job. And furthermore, according to Spain's official st statistics from the government, 27.8, that is nearly 28 percent of people in Spain, are at risk of poverty, and that figure is getting worse by the year. Meanwhile, NATO and the U.S. military, uh, the U.S. military, the U.S.-led military cartel, and the U.S. government are trying to pressure Spain to double its military spending. Meanwhile, the neoliberal bureaucrats in 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 Brussels are trying to force Madrid to continue to impose more neoliberal policies and more austerity, which is making life hard for people in Spain. So in that context, you can now, I'm not going to play the full speech that I translated of this leftist Spanish lawmaker, Gerardo Pizarrejo, where he criticizes NATO and the Western war drive. Señorías de la derecha, como comprenderán, sumarnos al ardor belicista que vienen a exhibir hoy aquí, en medio de una grave emergencia social y energética, sería un acto propio de pirómanos. Porque vamos a decirlos claro, lo que ustedes vienen a proponer aquí no garantiza ninguna tranquilidad ni ninguna seguridad a las familias trabajadoras y a la ciudadanía en general. Entre otras razones, porque de entrada supondría dedicar millones de euros a enriquecer el negocio armamentístico cuando ni la inflación ni el desempleo se van a resolver sembrando Europa con más ojivas nucleares o con más buques de guerra. Después de la catastrófica retirada de la OTAN de Afganistán y después de la invasión de Ucrania por parte de Rusia, es evidente que Europa necesita un nuevo modelo de seguridad. Pero si algo hemos aprendido de todo eso, tenemos que tener claras dos cosas al menos. La primera, que ese modelo de seguridad tiene que ser un modelo autónomo, 
un modelo europeo, no un modelo subordinado a Estados Unidos ni a ninguna otra potencia. Y, en segundo lugar, que ese modelo de seguridad autónoma debería servir no a la escalada sin fin, sino a un valor fundacional de Europa y de Naciones Unidas, la paz como condición para una prosperidad compartida. Yo entiendo que el Partido Popular, que ya nos metió en la guerra de Irak con Blair y con George Bush, no vea claro este objetivo. Pero al menos podrían escuchar a gente conservadora, de su propia cuerda, que recuerda que cada día de guerra son miles de víctimas civiles, con éxodos masivos, con devastación económica, con madres que lloran a sus hijos soldados muertos. Nosotros, por ejemplo, hubiéramos querido hospedar una cumbre en la que se recuerde que la principal amenaza para la seguridad no son los refugiados ucranianos o los refugiados sirios o los africanos que la principal amenaza para la seguridad son las disputas imperiales por recursos energéticos, la concentración de la riqueza, las desigualdades que provocan las migraciones. Hubiéramos querido una cumbre en la que se explicara que aumentar el gasto militar cuando hay necesidades acuciantes y cuando solo Francia, Alemania, Italia y España cuadriplican el gasto militar de Rusia es un sinsentido absoluto. Nosotros hubiéramos querido una cumbre en la que se dijera que el principal desafío de Europa no es disuadir generando miedo, sino persuadir. Es decir, ser un impulsor creíble de la paz y de la resolución negociada de los conflictos en Ucrania, en Yemen, en Palestina o en el Sáhara. Pero eso no va a ocurrir porque la cumbre de la OTAN no se ha organizado para fortalecer la causa de la paz por la que abogaron gente como Altiero Spinelli, como Petra Kelly o como Olof Palme. Esta cumbre se ha organizado básicamente para reforzar las prioridades geoestratégicas de los Estados Unidos, que no son Ucrania, que no son Europa, sino que son sobre todo debilitar a China. Por eso, señorías, Mr. Marshall no ha venido a esta cumbre con un pacto de inversiones sociales y verdes bajo el brazo. No ha venido con un, con un Green Deal, New Deal bajo el brazo. Ha venido a vendernos caro su gas de esquisto contaminante, sus granos transgénicos y sobre todo las armas de Lockheed Martin y de su industria bélica. Y han venido a decirnos que más que parar la guerra lo que hay que hacer es alimentarla. Y seamos sinceros, ese puede ser el proyecto de un belicista irresponsable como Boris Johnson, puede ser el proyecto de la ultraderecha polaca, puede ser el, ultra, el proyecto de la ultraderecha letona, pero no puede ser el proyecto de una Europa que se respete a sí misma, una Europa que se quiera autónoma y que aspira a construir una alternativa civilizatoria basada en la profundización de la democracia, en la paz y en la justicia social y ambiental. Ese otro proyecto europeo, autónomo, no solo es el que más conviene a los países del sur de Europa, es el único con el que podemos ganarnos el respeto del resto de pueblos del mundo, comenzando por África y por América Latina. Porque lo que África espera de nosotros, señorías, no es que vayamos a saquear sus recursos para luego militarizar la frontera sur y disparar a quienes intenten atravesarlas. Lo que África espera es un compromiso serio, no simplemente retórico, con un co-desarrollo que permita a sus niños y niñas comer cada día y no verse empujados a migrar cuando son adolescentes. Porque lo que América Latina espera de nosotros no es como propuso Felipe VI después de recibir a Biden a pie de avión que les invitemos a rendir vasallaje a la OTAN. Lo que esperan, lo que, se nos, ha dicho el, lo que nos ha dicho el expresidente Lula, lo que nos ha dicho el presidente López Obrador, es que busquemos la paz y la prosperidad compartida a partir de una relación respetuosa entre pueblos libres e iguales. Ese iberoamericanismo respetuoso, no arrogante, también es el que acaba de reclamar desde Colombia el presidente Petro. No permitan, señorías de la derecha, que las soflamas neocoloniales de los marqueses de Vargallosa estropeen esta oportunidad. Porque si eso ocurre, les puedo asegurar que África y América se rebelarán. Ya lo hicieron con Fernando VII, ya lo hicieron en Cuba y en Filipinas, apoyados por Pima, Gar y por Unamuno, y volverá a ocurrir si no entendemos que hay un nuevo orden multilateral que está emergiendo, que es irreversible, y que ningún imperio, ni viejo ni nuevo, va a poder detener. Gracias.